Good morning, everyone. How are we feeling? Everybody got their coffee, coffee cake? Yeah, excellent. All right, my name is Paige Klingenpeel. It's a heck of a last name. It's my husband's, but I love him. I am a licensed mental health counselor, but I get to work with teenagers all the time. What a blessing that is. So for the last 10 years, I have been working nonstop with teens and their parents. And then the last four years, I have been in and living in the trenches of a high school and a middle school. So my heart is for teens. How many people out there have teenagers or or kids in general? Raise your hands high, be proud of that. We're praying for you. (laughs) And as if that's not enough, not only am I a teen therapist, but I got four babies of my own, all under the age of 12. So again, reciprocate the prayers. (laughs) Come back and give me some love, right? Yeah. So I have such a passion to help teenagers and their parents, not only because teens are just awesome, I think they're an amazing season of life, but because I have kids of my own, I really want to equip them, I really want to engage them and empower them to make wise choices. So today we're going to talk a little bit about this up-and-coming generation, how they're a little different than the ones before. I'm sure you can uh, attest to that with some of your experiences. And then ways that we can still pour into them and empower and equip them so that one day they can lead this world with great health and wisdom. So let's start out with what were the titles of the previous generation? Because we all have them, right? I know we got baby boomers. What else do we have out there? Gen X, Gen Y, there's some Ys in there. Yeah, why is that? Millennials, Gen Z. Well, now we have a new one. It's called iGen. There's this amazing book out there by Dr. Jean Twinge that talks about iGen and how this generation is completely different than the ones prior to. And again, if you have exposure to kids and teenagers, you're recognizing something's off. Something has changed. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's not such a good thing. Well, what's unique about the season of adolescence, and if I can ask you to recall your own experiences going into the adolescent season, there were things you were looking forward to participating in. Rites of passages. So here are a few. Dating, driving, going to parties. Not that I'm condoning, but come on. You know, this is the time of experimentation. They get out there and do this stuff. And hopefully they're focusing on academics so that they can go on and go into college and be successful or trade school and create a career. How is this generation different in these rite of passages than the ones before? Well, let me tell you that research is showing us that they're not dating as much. And there's a reason behind that because first off, they don't call it dating. They call it talking. Yeah, what does that mean, right? And then secondly, with the driving, if their parents are willing to carpool them everywhere, why do they need to go and get the responsibility of driving? I don't know about you, but I was so stoked to get my driver's license and get out of my house. Kids today, they don't have that same motivation. And even though we should be celebrating the fact that kids are not engaging in alcohol and drug use, that that has been decreasing, that should be celebratory, right? The problem is, why? What's the difference here? And so we know that they're not dating, they're not driving, which implies that they don't also have jobs. They're not out partying. So that must mean they're doing their homework. They must be. All right, bad news, guys. They're not doing their homework. That's actually decreasing as well. Academically focused, no longer an option for them. They're just not interested. So what are they doing? Where are we seeing an increase in some of their behaviors? Well, unfortunately, in things that we wish we weren't seeing. There is an increase in kids spending more and more time alone. Okay, some of us are like, well, isn't that what teens do? That is that season of life where they're trying to do separate from their parents. They're trying to find their identity outside of that connection of that home life. So some of that is a common normal behavior. But unfortunately, the amount of time that they're spending alone is staggering, and it's creating more issues, like psychosomatic symptoms. Now, that's just a fancy word that basically shows I have my master's degree, right? Psychosomatic, it's a big fancy word that basically means all the emotional, psychological stuff going on inside their heads is manifesting through biological, physical ailments. 
Like they're not sleeping as much. They can't focus. They can't think. They can't be a productive part of their academic career. So we're seeing that more and more. And then we're also seeing a huge increase in anxiety, depression, self-harm behaviors, and suicide. This is very disconcerting, something that we should all be educating ourselves about. So what's going on with our kids? What is research showing us? Well, kids are staying kids longer. They are stuck in this emotional adolescent season of their life, living with their parents and seeing nothing wrong with that. But we have to ask ourselves why. Why is this generation so different than the ones before, even just 20 years before? Well, I believe it's a couple reasons. First, parenting. Parenting has completely changed. I always joke um, with myself and my husband, uh, tongue in cheek, of course, being a therapist, that I don't have a college fund, I have a therapy fund for my kids. Because we as parents are constantly trying to do the best possible thing that we can do to help our kiddos, but we're going to fail. We're going to make mistakes. And that's very scary. So what does that fear do? It dominates our parenting style and it changes the way that we interact with our kids. And that is not always in a positive thing. So parenting styles have changed. Secondly, technology. So all the things that I mentioned in regards to the rite of passages, the dating, the driving, not getting a job, not drinking, not doing academics, all correlate with the same time frame that handheld smart devices were created. And I don't believe that's a coincidence. So let's talk a little bit about how is technology changing teens, and frankly, us as adults as well. We'll start with how is it impacting the brain. And we are seeing more and more research on how technology is altering brain development in our kiddos and in you guys as well. One of the first things, instant gratification. How many times has our kids come and told us, I need this right now, and we're like, take a break, take a breather, I got some stuff I got to do. We teach them that through that interaction. What does technology do? What do you need to know? When do you need to know it? Right now. Remember the times when you were in elementary school and you couldn't spell a word, and your teacher told you to go pick up a dictionary? And you're like, I don't know how to spell the word. How am I supposed to find it in the dictionary? (laughs) What do we do now? Suri and Alexa, they're one of my best friends. I really love them a lot. Because instantly, I can get the information that I want. Now, how is that a negative? I mean, there's certainly positives to that. But a negative is, it's not teaching our kids resiliency. It's not teaching them problem-solving skills. It's not allowing them to experience stress and build stress tolerance. And that's ultimately going to affect them, not only in their brain, but in their life as well. Another part of technology and how it's contributing is the constant need of stimulus. Think about the last movie, the last TV show that you watched. Have you ever noticed that it changes the angle, changes the image, changes the screen within seconds? Not minutes, within seconds. Because, this is intentional on the director and producer's part, because they know you're going to stay more focused. Images and content is constantly stimulating your brain to stay focused. Our brains are so cool, it has something called neuroplasticity, meaning it is adapting to the environment that is exposed to. So in essence, if our brain is constantly used to the stimulus, then it's going to need the stimulus to stay focused. And yet, friends, we are asking kids to stay seated all day long in class, learn, absorb, and then to basically vomit onto standardized tests and do well, right? We're asking our kids to go from one way of learning to another, instantly disconnecting them from the whole process altogether. And then the need to feed affirmation. I don't know if you're on social media at all, but there is this amazing thing that happens when you get followers, likes, post comments, all of those things. It elicits feel-good chemicals in your brains. I have a therapy dog that I get to bring with me to the high school and the middle school. He's frankly so much cooler than I am. He has an Instagram page. He has 1,020 followers, right? He's kind of a big deal. He should be giving the TED Talk, let's be honest. 
He's pretty fantastic. The thing is, that's where kids are. That's why I created it, is because that's where kids are. But what's happening with this is kids get on there trying to figure out who they are. All of a sudden, they get a like, they get a post, they get a follow. It elicits that feel-good chemical in their brain. Then they start equating that with their worth, identity, and value. What happens when no more followers, no more post likes? Who are they? Where does their value come from? So there's a lot of distorted thinking when it comes to these things. And then how is technology impacting relationships? I see this more and more. Um, we are designed to look each other in the eye. Right now, I am analyzing you, not only because I'm a therapist, but because that's how we communicate face-to-face, -face, body language. And if we had a conversation, I'd listen to your inflection of your voice and the words that you choose. There's something beautiful about having that type of communication. And we learn that because we're an older generation. That's how we were trained. That's how it was modeled. Kids today, majority of their conversations are through text, social media. So they're not getting the same education and the same modeling. So in essence, they're losing the ability to communicate and to recognize other people's emotions. That is decreasing their ability to have empathy. And empathy, my friends, is a very important thing for everyone to have and to have in relationships. And this goes up into the next one where it talks about objectification of others. No longer are we seeing, and adults struggle with this as well, if you just check out any news feed, and how the horrible things that are, we are projecting onto other cultures and other people. You would never walk up to someone and say, you're fat, you're ugly, you're stupid, and you should go kill yourself. I would hope that that evokes in you some visceral response of, whoa, no, never would I do that. Because we have in our brains not only the empathy, but we also have this connection of the way we learned how to communicate. We know words have power, and they affect people, and there's consequences. Whereas these kiddos are online typing out these exact words, and I have seen it. I have seen these words texted out, sent to other people, not having the same consequences, and not seeing how these words impact someone else. Friends, this is something that is happening more and more, and adults are starting to model it as well. So technology is changing the way we view humanity and we view each other. So what can we do? Why should we care? Because this generation is gonna come up and lead this world one day. We want them to be healthy. We want them to be equipped and empowered. So I believe that we can transform teens in three different ways. Because technology will constantly change, but there are things intrinsically that are a part of us that will never change, and that is those three core needs. To be loved, to be safe, and to have purpose. When we pour into those, and not just parents, but anybody that has a connection with a kiddo, pour into those, guaranteed that's gonna start changing some things. So to be loved, this is one of the ones that I feel like is the most distorted. To be loved, even the word usage is thrown out so flippantly. How many people love pizza? How many people love sushi? How many people love ice cream? Right, that's the way we talk. But yet I can say I love my kids. I got four kids that I would literally lay my life down for. Yet I'm using the same word of love in that context. It's so flippant. We don't recognize what love is anymore. It's so distorted because of our adaptation to our culture. So what does love look like? Love looks like boundaries. Love looks like structure. Love does not look like indulgence and giving them everything that you never had. That's not loving well. I have a great example of a kiddo who is living, quote unquote, the teen dream, do anything that he wants, invites girls over to his house at all hours, gets trouble at school, there's no consequences, he maintains his phone, he drinks alcohol, and he does drugs. Although there is one rule in his house, you can't smoke pot in the house, it has to be in the garage. You have to draw the line somewhere, right? <laughs> this kid is living that dream, spent two years with him, and one day he comes in crying, never seen this level of emotion in him before, and he says, 
Why does my mom not love me? Why does she let me do these things to myself? Even kids know they need that structure to feel safe and to feel loved. And we, as adults, not just parents, need to hold kids accountable to equip them for the real word, world. Now, I talk about discipline and punishment. A lot of times, parents just take away the cell phone, the devices, because that's gonna take care of the issue. There is a difference between discipline and punishment. Discipline is teaching. That is love. Punishment is just trying to hurt them where it hurts so that they learn their lesson. We have to alter the way that we ultimately love our kiddos. The next one, core need, is to be safe. And for all those that grew up in the 80s, you know, right? You celebrated your uniqueness with your appearance. We have to start doing that more with our kiddos. Yes, it is paramount that our kids feel physically safe, but what about emotionally? We need to allow them to explore their identity, whether it's in their appearance, in their behaviors, in their words, in the clubs that they join, the hobbies. We have to help them find who they really are. And sometimes that means your kid's going to come home looking like that. And that's okay. Behind closed doors, I always talk, use your Botox face, no expression, just non-smile. Okay. <laughs> that's loving well. Yes. All right, another thing that I think is super, super important in helping our kids feel safe, not only in themselves, but in the world around them, is highlighting the facts that they are going to have failures. And failures and mistakes is imperative to success. How many times you hear those stories of those amazing entrepreneurs who've created amazing things, who have continued to fall on their face, but got back up and created something pretty amazing. But instead, our kids are so fearful a performance that they're going to fail and mistake disappointment because they can't tolerate the negative feelings that will come from that. When we start highlighting the fact that it is important for you to make mistakes because that's actually going to add to your success, that's going to transform their entire shift of thinking. And finally, to have purpose. Have you ever seen one of those movies where it's the, uh, the world, it has that focus of the world, the globe, and then it zooms in to the continent, and then it zooms into the state, to the city, to the house, to the individual. I feel like this is an amazing analogy of how it is for us and our contributions to the world. We are all gifted with personality, strengths, and weaknesses. We need to start embracing those and sharing those. If you have breath here today, you have the opportunity to pour into a life that you never thought you did. You all have stories to share that are educating everyone else. That is impactful. You have that opportunity. We have to help our kids see that as well. Encourage them, help them explore, build them up and equip them to recognize that they are a part of something so much bigger than they ever thought. Give them the idea that they have purpose. There's this amazing quote that I think sums this up, where it says, the greatest good you can do for another is not just share your riches, keeping in mind riches isn't just monetary, but to reveal to him his own. That's beautiful. We gotta help kids understand that success is not equal to wealth, power, prestige, and image. Success is pouring out your giftedness onto others. Success is having integrity and being truthful, even when it's hard, and giving when you know you're not gonna get anything back. Success is using the stuff that you have been gifted with and sharing it with others. That's a beautiful thing. So for those of you that have kids and teens, I'm hopefully this is speaking to you, but those that don't have kids and are wondering, why is this something I should be passionate about? Why should I be helping this next generation? It's because, guys, not only are those kids going to be picking out your nursing home later on. <laughs> it's true, so always be kind. But it's also about they're going to be leading this world. They are. And I have great hope in their potential but just like with anything and anyone, we have to help guide them in the right way. We have to equip them, we have to empower them, and we have to love them well.
And that, that is something to get super excited about. Thank you.